Welcome to Tyler's Garage. Today I wanted to do a video about my quest for unlimited seltzer, share everything I've learned in the process, and hopefully that I could help you uh, when you're going through this process trying to figure out what sort of works for you. In the video, I'm going to first talk about why I love seltzer. That'll take just a short bit of time. And then some of the early methods I used for creating seltzer at my house, and then what I started to look at and started to learn through the internet. And then at the end, I'm going to show you my methods that I have at my house for my seltzer system that you may have seen in the video uh, that I have on online, which I'll also share um, a link to in the description here below. But all that said, why I love seltzer, I grew up drinking seltzer. My mom loved seltzer, and it was one of these things. I don't know if it's the effervescence of the bubbles. I don't know if it's the temperature, it's just being cool, or what it was, but I just always have loved seltzer. And so as I got my own place, I started to think about how I could create seltzer and essentially not purchase it in cans um, on a regular basis. And I sort of went through this change over time of trying the most simple way of doing it, which is the soda stream, and then going to more in-depth methods of, of working it out. So here, first thing, just talk a little bit about, here's the soda stream. So most people that are carbonating water at their house are using the soda stream. That said, I mean, it works. Uh, without a doubt. The issue is that it's labor intensive. You have to manually do each container and the cost for the refills is pretty expensive. So it can be annoying um, when you start looking at it, uh, how best to do it. You got to purchase a lot of their bottles, which by the way, I still use their bottles with my own system currently because they're probably the best long-term bottles for, um, for water, for carbonated water that I found. That said, What's interesting about carbonation is that there is a lot of science related to it. You have cold water, so you have the H2O plus the CO2, and then essentially um, they are going to mix with surface area and create more bubbles, which is going to increase the pressure. Now, some people like their water very lightly carbonated. Some like it very highly carbonated. I'm in the latter category, so that is one way I look at it. So moving on, so I had the soda stream at first, I found one used, you find a lot of people that buy them and then use them for a little bit and then get tired of them or whatnot. And so they have a very high secondary market. Plus they're just tons and tons of different models. Um, they cost about $120, which for what they are is an extremely large amount of money. And um, so that's version one. And here, I just wanted to show you one of the interesting things is there's going to be a lot with people that brew beer like to carbonate their beer after they brew it. And so a lot of the same methods that you use for carbonating water, you're going to use for carbonating beer. So that may also be something that you're considering. And this, what I like here, shows your temperature compared to your PSI. And then depending on what type of beverage you have, it depends on what type of PSI you really want. Um, and it also shows you how the lower the temperature, the higher you can get those volumes of, um, of bubbles, essentially. And I don't claim to know all this. I just claim to know what I've learned through my own research. So my first thing I did was what was called the soda mod. Uh, this is really simple. What you're going to do is instead of using the soda stream container, which is $30 to refill, you get CO2 containers for paintball guns. They're cheap. Uh, usually you can go around and you can um, get them refilled locally pretty easily. The issue with the soda stream is, as you see here, they have a proprietary blend or valve here that they like to use. So you can't just easily, um, you can't easily switch things over, even though CO2 has a standardization of, of the, um, con you know, of the, the nozzles, et cetera. That said, I did this at first and, and this works. The issue is when you're drinking a lot of soda water that it's inconvenient to go to the local sporting goods store every few weeks to get them refilled. I actually purchased 12, or excuse me, I purchased, I think three or four 12 ounce containers 
and um, would get them refilled. And what I experienced is locally at the sporting goods store, sometimes I'd drive over there, they were out of CO2. Sometimes I'd have to wait 30 minutes for somebody to be able to refill all of them. And though it was only about $2.40, 250 to to do it for each bottle, I started to get frustrated with that part of the process and having to manually go for each of the different, um, go for each of the different containers, you know, and going back and forth. So then I started to look and move to version 2.0, as I would call it, right here on the right, where I purchased through a air gas um, company, purchased a five pound container of CO2 and a hose, which enables you so that to um, put it so that you can get it all right there and you have to go and get it filled much more infrequently and it lasts a lot longer. I mean, like a year plus, depending on how much CO2. This works um, well. The only issue here is that you ha still have to manually do it. And also when you're manually doing it, you really want to have that water pre-chilled. So you need to remember to take the water, put it in the soda stream container, put it in the refrigerator, then go and, um, and then carbonate it, which a lot of times you forget. And if the water is not at a very low, you know, relatively low temperature, we're talking 38, 40 degrees refrigeration temperature, you're not going to have as, as high effervescence or as high on the amount of seltzer water in there. So that's something to consider too. So the other problem with this design is it's rather unsightly to have a five pound container of CO2 sitting on your um, kitchen counter there. So that's another thing to consider. So here is my version 2.0, which obviously was moved to the garage. Um, but as you can see, it works. Um, and I had simply got, you know, they're quite smart. They, those hoses for this, the soda mod um, is about $100, but it, it does work as it's supposed to. But I started after doing this for probably six months, I started to want to take it to the next step and figure out what I could do to make it easier. And I essentially wanted what I, when you go out to a fast food restaurant, you can just simply get it on tap right there. And that's a very nice feature. And I wanted to have that at my house. So version two was forced carbonation. And this is going to be very familiar to those that are in the brewing beer. They brew the beer in these, and then they put it in these, what are called pony kegs here. And essentially when they do that, they're then going to turn it up to about 110 PSI on the CO2 regulator and push CO2 into the, into the pony keg for a period of time. And with that, once you've done it for a period of time, it will force carbonate. And so to get this working right, you really need two refrigerators, one for serving, one for, um, one for force carbonating, depending on how much you're doing. You also can use beer taps, um, et cetera. You need it to be refrigerated. You need to cool the water down. And so this is what I started doing. Um, but it can be sort of every once in a while having to fill up those five gallon containers, set up the force carbonator, because you'll have to have a second CO2 to have a little lower pressure CO2 for serving. So you have one CO2 regulator for for forced carbonization, and then you have a second CO2 regulator that's just putting a little bit of CO2 to force the water out as you're serving. So this was version 2.0. Um, it worked. I just got frustrated with having to constantly fill up the water and constantly um, having to deal with that part of it. And I really wanted to take it to the next level in terms of being able to make it so that I could have the um have it on tap so this is uh, for a lot of beer people this is sort of where they stop and, and what works for them so i started looking at what was out there in terms of seltzer the first thing i really started to understand was the most important or most challenging aspect of it is not the carbonator itself but it's what's called the cold plate or the way that you're going to chill the water because for these devices to work, you have to use a chiller or a, some way, an ice bath. Uh, and so what I started to look at is some options out there 
commercially. There's a company in Belmont, North Carolina called Soda Dispenser Depot, and this is off of their website. And as you can see, to get this kind of stuff is, is not cheap, all right? And so I was looking here, you had what, here you would need essentially an ice bath all the time, or here you have, I think it uses glycanol and electricity to create a, um, to cool it down. But as you can see, the cost there is pretty high. So I started thinking refrigerators aren't very expensive. And if I could figure out a way to merge the refrigerator as the cooler for the system, then I thought to think maybe I can make this work. Uh, so one of the cool things is for all of us is we have access to so much information that you can start looking out there. So here's also just some remanufactured units where you maybe save a hundred dollars, but it's still pretty expensive. Um, relative. That said, I found this thread on um, Homebrew Talk, and it was all about a guy from San Angelo, Texas, who wanted to have seltzer on tap. Now, he didn't like the city water, so this was what he set up. Essentially, he had a Brita filter, Brita water that would go to a pump. Now, this pump is, I think, is going to be used for, typically for um, well water, and then this water worker, which was essentially a uh, pump, or excuse me, where you would leave a water tank for pressurization. Then he moved it to the McCann's filter. And then he had the McCann's filter going into the tank. And basically what was so ingenious here is he had taken these two, the tank and the motor, which typically come mounted together, he'd taken them apart. And because he took them apart, it helped to be able to, um, essentially use the refrigerator as the cooling device. And then he shows how the CO2 comes in there. It's mixed automatically and then soda out. So I started looking at this and realizing I can make this work. Now, the nice thing is because I'm on city water, I have plenty of water pressure and the water tastes pretty good where I live. I didn't need any of this stuff over here. So what I started to look at was how I could jerry rig a system in using the McCann's motor and the McCann's tank. And the other issue was, um, most important thing, as I mentioned, is about the cold plate, is about figuring out a way to have the water be chilled while it's being mixed. And that's why I started to look at taking the tank, taking the motor, separating them, and then eliminating the need for a cold plate because essentially the water would already be in the fridge and so it would already be chilling as it is being mixed together. So here's the McCann's Big Mac uh, carbonator, as it's called. You can see the motor here, and you can see the container here, the pressurization. It's a really cool system because essentially what it does is it has a sensor in here, which I think it's just a float valve, which is able to determine whether or not there's enough water in there. And it automatically adds water through this pump here, which has water coming in and then water going right in here. And then right here is where the CO, I believe it's right here, the CO2 enters, uh, that's through a check valve. And then output here of the soda water. Here you have a essentially just a pressure release valve. That said, um, so looking at that, and the ingenious aspect of being able to take these apart, which I can show you right here in my picture, where essentially you take apart and you're going to mount the motor outside of the refrigerator and you're going to mount the Big Mac inside the refrigerator. In terms of availability of Big Macs, uh, you can purchase these used. Sometimes you can find them on Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, very reasonably priced. I actually purchased one brand new on eBay for about $350. And then just a few weeks later, I found one that was low listed on Craigslist for only $40. So I picked it up just so that I would have extra parts, et cetera, in case I had an issue or needed something um, related to that. And then I eventually actually put the two containers in tandem, which works great for my CO2, for my seltzer water setup. So here you can see the first version of it where I had it. And then, um, so you had the water coming in, the connector, 
And then um, the carbonated water coming out right here, the CO2. I had originally designed this part down here where it would act as almost like a pre-chiller. But what I encountered is it started freezing a lot because the diameter of the water was so, uh, diameter of the hose was so small and the water mountain in there. So it actually caused problems. So I nixed that idea and just went straight in from then on. Uh, here on the right, you can see uh, what I, some people used a bar gun um, instead of cutting a hole in their front of their refrigerator. So that's also another option. I wanted to show you here on the front. So this is the Flomatic 202 valve, um, serving valve. And then on the back side of that, essentially um, you have the pipe coming in a Y uh, to go to the Flomatic because on the Flomatic, you actually have two um, inputs for water so that you can get more volume of water um, when you're when you're doing using the Flomatic. So it's something to consider um, to get a Y on there and make sure it obviously it's stainless steel. We'll talk about that in a moment, more about that in a moment. Uh, here also were just some other versions I found online that started to make me think that I could do stuff. Uh, this is one where he had used, oops, the Brita filter here and then had a pump back here or Brita water, had the pump, then had it going to this uh, water worker pressurization and then going to the um, motor for the McCanns and then the big, um, and then uh, the tank there, and then the serving was on the top. But this is a lot of complexity that you may be able to avoid. One thing I noticed is, as I talked earlier about the water freezing, some other guys tried to put inline tanks for cooling, chilling the water before it went into the McCann's tank. But each of these I saw because this water after it's in that goes through there has some pressurization it would cause these tanks to explode so something to consider well you're probably not going to be able to do that here's another image this is showing how the wiring harness can be extended um, the extension of the wiring harness allows you to separate that tank from the motor um, which is one way to do it this shows the wiring. So the wiring is super simple. It's three, there's a white, there's a green, and there's a black. And as long as you connect the same on each side, you should have no problem. You can use any three prong extension cord with the ground, use the ground as one of the wires. So, and making sure to connect the same on each side. Um, it does actually, as you can see here, have a clip. So what I did is I cut it right here, uh, used a longer, extension cord and then reconnected it retaining this uh, retaining this connector on there it also makes it easier when you have the motor and then the float valve basically the float valve inside so it enables you something to disconnect reconnect uh, you can find these McCann's filters for not too expensive this is somebody showing that they had taken the McCann's and actually uh, cleaned the inside out and this shows what the float valve actually looks like inside that connects right there going into. And so essentially once it hits a predetermined threshold, it will allow you to put, um, you put more water in it. It automatically puts the water in and that's, what's the ingenious about that. It does what you were doing with the soda stream automatically. Now, one of the things I encountered living in the city is I have pretty good water pressure at 70 PSI here. And what I found is that when I was carbonating that I actually needed to use a pressure regulator, which is I purchased um, and you can see right here that to lower the pressure to around 40 to 50 PSI because at 70 PSI, I was having problems with the um, pressure of the water and the pressure of the carbonator. It was getting out of sync and it, basically they were fighting um, for pressure from the CO2. And so what it, what eventually worked was to lower the pressure to 50 PSI. And once I got it between 40 and 50 PSI, then the pressure, which was higher coming from the CO2 container, uh, was able to mix correctly. Uh, so something to consider. I picked this up. The nice thing, it has a screw here so you can adjust it when you're looking at um, and then this valve so this um, will show you what the psi of the water is coming out before it goes to 
the filter. What I love about the internet is you research, you look and you figure out more. This guy posted showing uh, one idea, which was the Flomatic 202 for the post mix valve. Um, and essentially, I think what you would typically have here is you'd have one with the syrup and then one with the water. What I did is I essentially used both for the water. So it um, fills up much more quickly. Uh, the nice thing also is you don't have any power on this, so there's nothing more that you have to deal with. The only challenge with it is the mounting. Uh, you use onaker clips when you're creating this. Uh, I wanted to show here just those clip connections and also making sure to use stainless steel connectors after the pump, and I'll go into that here in a little bit more detail just in a second. This shows above my fridge, so what I did is I mounted the motor outside of the fridge above the fridge and actually later what I did is I put, um, put some rubber washers and a rubber spa motor um, anti-vibration bracket under the motor. And this was to mitigate some of the um, movement of the motor or the vibrations of the motor because when this thing starts going, it, it goes pretty pretty strong and so it will move around on you. So it does have to be mounted to a surface and you need to figure out, I actually have it mounted to the wall um, and I'm not sure if that's the best mounting way, but that shows you. And then you can see right there, the 20 pound CO2 containers. I always have one in backup so I don't have to worry and I can just go when both are empty and I always have a backup. Now this here shows what I am doing with mine. And this gives you a very good idea of what may work for you. So first off, starting on the right there, you have the CO2 container and um, you need to have that about 80 PSI. Remember the soda regulator has to be higher than the water PSI. That's why when I had the water PSI at like 70 PSI, it was causing issues because the pressure of the CO2 was not much higher. And so I had issues with that. What happens is, is that you have the water goes to the McCann's pump. And it's okay on this side of the pump to use brass fittings, but as soon as it leaves that pump, because of how CO2 works and you do not want CO2 um, and brass, you need to use stainless steel fittings from then on. Then as you can see here, you have it go to the McCann's pump and then you go to the mixing container. In the mixing container is where you're going to have the water and the CO2 mix and then I, because I was able to find one very reasonably priced, um, did a second reserve tank and then the Flomatic serving dispenser. So I hope this is a lot of knowledge collected over a long period of time. And I really wanted the opportunity to share it with you guys because I thought it was very helpful. I hope you found this helpful. Um, if I can give you more information or you have a question about something, you don't understand something, uh, please leave in the comments below. And if you could subscribe, that would be awesome. I uh, look forward to presenting more about this and telling more. And as I learn something more, obviously sharing it with you guys. Thank you so much for listening and making it all the way through this uh, Tyler's Garage presentation. And I hope you enjoyed it. And I look forward to, uh, to hearing from you.